Hello everyone, we are back with the seventh series. We interviewed for you surf legend, world champion, surf photographers, shapers, and many more. We hope you like the series and please stay tuned for more amazing news. Mahalo. Aloha, welcome to the third episode of our seventh series. Today with us from California, former winner of 1984 Pipeline Masters, Joy Buran. We discuss with him about those amazing gears, surf, surfboards, and much more. Hi, Joy, welcome to the show. Where are you today? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm here in Huntington Beach at my home. So today we're going to talk about many, many things. Uh, but uh, of course, the first question that I ask everybody is, in your opinion, what is the most important thing in surfing? Wow. To have fun, to enjoy it, to enjoy yourself. You know, surfing is one of the most enjoyable things you can do as a human being with recreation, the lifestyle, to be in the ocean, to be around creation, to be with friends, the human experience, you know, like, Surfing is a lifestyle, and it's so special, and, and riding a wave is, I mean, isn't it the most amazing thing the first time you ever catch a wave and stand up? So it's like, I think the most important thing in surfing is to enjoy yourself and have a great time with uh, doing it and with the people and other people in the water and your friends and family and just in creation. It's, it's, it's tough to enjoy it. Yeah, I totally agree with you, you know, and uh, I I like the, the part of creating like a human experience, you know, because I guess the friends that you have uh, through surfing are, are real good friends for lifetime, right? I mean, most of the cases. Yes, they are. Most of the cases, so. Uh, and let's, uh, let's start this interview going back a little bit of uh, your uh, life as a surfer. Do you remember your first surfboard? And do you still have it by yeah. any chance? Uh, I do. I remember my first surfboard. Uh, my parents bought it for me for $30 in 1973 in March for my 12th birthday. I was turning 12 years old, and I lived in Carlsbad, uh, San Diego County. And I wanted to surf, and we went down to what was called Offshore Surf Shop there at Tamarack Beach. And for $30, they bought me a used blue surfboard. And uh, I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I did, of course. I don't have the board I won the Pipe Masters on either. You know, it's funny when you get older and you're 60, you think, oh, I should have saved that board. I should have saved this. I should have saved that. But older people all know, like, you save all the things you don't need and the things you wish you would have saved, you didn't save. So uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't have my first surfboard, but I have the memory of it. That's for sure. Okay, at least, you know, something stays, you're right. And then maybe that, yeah. <laughs> that surfboard is still living with somebody, still reading it somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. So, do you, well, uh, 1973 is a long time ago. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I do have, I have some of the boards from my career. I have a board from 1980 okay. and I have a board from 1984 that were significant in my professional career. But those are the oldest boards I have. 1984, it was like uh, the Pipeline Master victory, right? And uh, uh, yes, 1980. Uh, what but what was that? I when I won Brazil uh, in 1980, I was the first. It was the first time a Californian won on the uh, World Pro Surf Tour, the old ITS tour, and I won at Apodor Beach in Brazil. And uh, that board was a single fin, and I still have it. And it's, it's on display right now at the Surf Museum. Uh, they're doing a Donald Takayama display, and Donald Takayama made that board. So I still have that board. So that's very significant. And the board from 1984 was a four-fin epoxy when no one wrote four-fins or epoxies. And I won, um, I won a major event on the East Coast, the Tropics Grand Prix, and I won a truck, a car, on that board. And I still have that board as well. But not the Pipe Masters board. The Pipe Masters board belonged to Glenn Minami from Town and Country. And I always left my board in Hawaii and I, it just disappeared with time. <laughs> oh my God. You know, that would have been a good one to have, right? And so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. And you had like. Um, uh, you were saying about these two uh, big moments of your of your career as a surfer. Do you consider them as a defining moment for you, or or there is something else? Well, I think 
probably the first defining moment for me was making the Pipe Masters final in 1978 when I was 17. Wow. Because the Pro Tour had only existed for three years. It was the time where Hawaiians were still like the kings, you know, the soul of Hawaii, Larry Bertelman, Jerry Lopez. And, um, and you know, being a goofy foot, I dreamed of winning a surfing pipeline and being like Jerry Lopez. So when I made the finals in 1978, when I was 17, I was in that final with Jerry Lopez and Roy Russell, Dan Kiloa, Hans Hiedemann, and Australian Larry Blair. That was the defining moment because that was on national TV. And I was very successful, much more than anyone expected of me. And I, I felt like that's when I knew I could do it. I felt like when I was 17 and I made that final, that I could live my dream. And so that was a defining moment. When I won Brazil in 1980, that was very important to win on the tour. That was a defining moment. And then, of course, uh, winning the Pipeline Masters in 1984, that was the highlight of my career. So those are probably the three. I, I, I won 12 pro contests. I was in 30 professional finals. But that Pipe Masters final in 78, winning Brazil in 80, and getting into the top 16 in the world, and then winning the Pipe Masters, those, those are the three biggest moments of my career. Yeah, definitely. You know, like when you were 17 facing Jerry Lopez or Rory Russell, you know, like. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was crazy. It was awesome. <laughs> exactly. You know, like how, how many people can say that, right? It's like, oh. My right. God. And, and, and the, the final was one hour. And what I remember is I was hooting for them. Like, I was paddling out looking at Jerry Lopez and I was hooting. I was screaming like, yeah. like <laughs> you don't you know, you're like, who does that? You know, <laughs> exactly. for you, it was already a victory being there, you know, like with uh, one of the, yeah, I for real. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that, that's why I always tell people, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to win to be successful. You know, you, ha you give your best effort. And you don't always win with your best effort, but your best effort is going to bring you joy and your own success. And so people are often surprised when I tell them being in the finals when I was 17 is a career highlight because I didn't win and I didn't even really have a very good final. But just to be there, that was a huge success and it's a great memory. I won contests. I don't even remember much about them, but being in the finals with Jerry Lopez, Who's gonna forget that? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Definitely. I right, you know? <laughs> I agree with you. And um and so you were talking about also about the pipeline masters, of course, uh, the the peak, let's say, of, of your career. Um what is the best memory of that event? Part winning, well, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, of course uh, I won the event and I served quite a few pipe masters. That was my third final. I made the finals with Jerry Lopez in 78. I made it again in 1980 when Mark Richards won. And then I almost made it. I lost in the semis. And then I had kind of some, some bad breaks. So the day that I won was unusual because they held the whole contest in one day. Normally, the Pipe Masters, as you know, even now takes two or three or four days to complete. But in 1984, It was just one day, and I tell people it was a lot like the Eddie, where they just waited for the biggest, best day with 20, with 24 surfers, and they held it in um, all in one day. A couple of things I remember about that day is in the morning when I paddle out for my warm-up surf, it was huge. It was second reef. It was big. And in my warm-up surf, I didn't catch one wave. I, I did not, I, I didn't catch a wave at all. I paddled out there and I couldn't catch a wave. And so like that, that doesn't build your confidence, you know? <laughs> no, so definitely. the warm up serve, I always remember I didn't even catch one wave. And then when on my first heat, I had Sean Thompson, Marvin Foster and Jonathan Dom, who was a very good goofy foot, uh, local at pipeline. And what I, what I always remember, this is this kind of a funny story. I, I really don't get to tell this story too often. So yeah, I got to tell this. But when we paddled out for our heat, you know, we paddled out and we're in the channel and you, you, you know, you're in deeper water and you're, and you're watching the heat that's in the water and you're going to start in about, you know, five or 10 minutes. But 
there was a massive set, like this huge set. And it, it, it broke like out, outside Pupa Kea, you see it, and then second these pipeline. And it was so big that it was giant white water in the channel. So it, wow. it broke it broke on us. It was like 15 feet of white water in deep water, more like sunset. And Marvin Foster and I, we were good friends since we were kids competing in amateur events. We, we, we both had to throw our boards. You know, we had leashes on and we threw our boards. And, you know, we just got clobbered. And when we came up, you know, like, you're so nervous. I can't even, you can't understand how nervous you are before you're heating the pipeline masters. You're so, so nervous. But when we got hit by that water, we came up and we looked at each other and, and both of our leashes held and we looked at each other and we started laughing. <laughs> like we, we just looked at each other. We're like, we just started laughing. And then like it, it, we both just, that was good, man. That just put, that just put me at ease getting hit by 15 foot white water kind of woke me up and took care of my nerves and me and Marvin Foster looking at each other laughing that that was fine and then the very first wave I caught that day in that heat was a 20 foot barrel that closed out on me I didn't make it and I remember that wave and after that Alessandro I barely remember everything I never fell again the entire day I made every barrel I caught every great wave I made Every barrel. That was the only wave I fell all day. I never fell again. I beat John Thompson. I beat Tom Carroll. I beat Derek Coe, Robert, Mark Acalupo, everybody. I never lost and I never fell again. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's a it was like a dream. Thought. Like, you know, when they say you're in the zone, you know, like you're in the zone. Yeah, exactly. Like in, in soccer, football, whatever, baseball or, or tennis. Like I, I barely remember anything. I just remember the the first heat, the big white water, laughing Marvin Foster. I didn't. I got the big giant closed out barrel that was like a house. It was so big, and I didn't make it. And after that, every everything went right. And then the next thing I, you know, the day's over and I won. Like it was crazy. Yeah, amazing. You know, maybe and everything started yeah, I, to I like, have uh, fun, you know, to a fun experience at least. You know, like <laughs> you yeah. laughing. Well, and then. But Alessandro, in the final, the one thing that is most profound, and this is why people always, a lot of people remember my win, well, because I was a Californian, because I always said I was going to win it. But also, you know, when I won, I said, dreams come true. And, and, and this is just the, the way it is. And, I, and, you know, of course, I'm a Christian, and I've been living, living for Jesus for almost 35 years. And I've always had faith, but the night before I won the Pipe Masters, I dreamed I won the Pipe Masters. I had a dream that I was in the heat and Derek Ho, I was powering out and Derek Ho was in a barrel and he didn't make that barrel. And that was a dream I had. And then in the same dream, I dreamed that I won. And then I woke up and it was a dream. And I was like so bummed because I was dreaming I won, but I didn't win. But that was the same. So that was December 17th when I woke up. Well, then I won on December 17th. But in the final, in that final, everything was going my way. And I was paddling back out. And Derek Ho was in that barrel. And he didn't make it. And it's exactly like my dream. And I was like, that's my dream. Like, God showed me the final before it happened. And I knew when Derek Ho didn't make that barrel, that I was going to win the Pipe Masters. So when I won, I said, dreams come true. And then not just that that was my dream of my whole career, but I literally dreamed it the night before. Wow. <laughs> and, and that was it. Like, I, I won. Like, when Derek Ho didn't make that barrel, like, I knew. Like, I really believe. I was like, I knew that I was going to win. And then after that happened, it rained in the final. And, you know, Pipeline has different uh, moods. You know, it'll be, like, really clean for 20 minutes. It'll be, like, 12 really good waves and then there'll be a rip and it'll get kind of funky and wonky for 20 minutes right after that with Derek Ho, I had all the waves I needed to win and then it rained a rain squall came through and then there was a big rip and there wasn't another good wave the rest of the final wow. and I, I knew I sat out there in the last five minutes looking at Tom Carroll Mark Acalupo mm -hmm. and Derek Ho, and I thought my God, I've won the fight masters. I'm going to win. <laughs>
<laughs> again, again, you were like a challenging so big name. Yeah, those are the things I remember. Isn't that funny? Like not catching a wave in my warm up, getting hit by the white water, the close out barrel, Garako, the dream. I hardly remember any of the barrels that I made. Wow. Because like they just became a blur. But I remember those moments. That's what I remember. And when I came in from that final, this is before computer scoring. So you you didn't know. They weren't announcing scores like you do now. You just kind of, you kind of just had to feel like, hey, you, back in the day, you kind of knew like, hey, I had a good heat, I had a bad heat, I had a great heat. Yeah. Well, I felt like I had a great heat. And when I came in, the crowd came to me. The whole, all the beats came to me. So the beats thought I won, even though they hadn't announced it yet. The beats thought I won. Mm -hmm. And uh, my good friend from Carlsbad, Billy Stang, who was a pipeline surfer, he came up to me. He's the first person who came up to me. He said, Joey, you just won the pipe masters. Wow. Wow. But anyway, you knew it already. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the day I, before. I knew, but I did know because it, it, it wasn't official. So when they announced, <laughs> when they go sixth place, you know, uh, Tom Carroll, fifth place, Ralph Bartholomew, you know, uh, fourth place, Derek Coe, third place, Max Madero. And then when they said second place, Mark Lupo, it was like I was in shock. Yeah. Like any and then I realized I won, and I and I wasn't sure if I heard right. And Tom Carroll, Mark Lupo was to my right hand, and Tom Carroll was to my left hand. And Tom Carroll and I were very good friends, and Mark Lupo and I were not good friends. <laughs> you know, so like Mark Lupo beat me three contests in a row before the fight master, wow. man on man. And Tom Carroll grabbed me and he said, you won, you won, mate, you won. Exactly what he said. Yeah. But definitely... That's what I remember about December. That's what I remember about December 17th, 1984. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Yeah, it's a special day. I mean, every year, December 17th, I wake up like it's Christmas, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> few days in advance. few days in advance. Yeah. My, 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 my wife is always like, well, here we go. <laughs> it's your day. <laughs> exactly. You receive gifts in advance, you know, like uh, for Christmas, not nothing. <laughs> yeah. Who's the champ? Who's the champion today? Honey, you're the champion. That's right. Who's the champion? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, <laughs> up to now in the interview, um, you, you name like uh, amazing surfers, uh, like uh, uh, athletes uh, in your career or in your life until now. Uh, was there a meeting with a surfer uh, that not, not necessarily has to be like a world champion or a super famous surfer that was very meaningful for you? Well, yes. You know, when I went out on the tour in 1978, I was like one of very few Californians. There, there weren't any Californians ranked in the top 40 in the world. And the tour was almost all Australians, a lot of Hawaiians, and then a, a, Brazil, a couple of Brazilians, a couple of South Africans like Sean Thompson. And a lot of those guys were my heroes from the surf magazines. But I think, you know, looking back, Sean Thompson was very uh, inspiring and he was very, he wrote for O'Neill Westwoods and I wrote for O'Neill Westwoods. So I learned a lot from Sean Thompson about, you know, just how to treat people, how to carry myself, how to represent the sport, how to be my own person, the California kid. You know, now they say, you know, you build your brand. You know, we didn't say stuff like that in the seventies, but, but I was Joy Brand. I was a California kid. So I learned a lot from Sean Thompson. He was kind of like a big brother to me. Dan Kialoa, the great Hawaiian, we were very close, uh, really close, because we both rode town and country surfboards. And I lived with him one year on the North Shore. He was like a big brother to me. I, I, I learned uh, so much from him. He was a very special influence on my life. And then I have to say, like, Tom Carroll was amazing. I was very close with Tom Carroll, the great Australian, because at that time, there weren't any goofy foot in the top of the world. And Tom Carroll was always going to be better than me. Um, he just, Tom Carroll was amazing. And when Tom Carroll won a pro tour event at Birdie Heads in a right-hand point break, that was the first time a, a Goofy Foot ever even made a final in a right-hand point break. Like, Goofy Foots were always like a second-class citizen in pro surfing in the 70s. 
And all the surf spots were right point breaks, like Bells and Burlyhead and Sunset Beach and stuff like that. So when Tom Carroll began to win on his backhand, that was very, very inspiring uh, for me. And I always cheered for Tom Carroll. He, he beat me five times, man on man. I never beat him. Uh, but we were good friends. And I don't know, like, you know, when you look back now, it's been, it's been 40 years. Yeah, oh my God, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's been 40 years. And, he, and these guys, like Sean Thompson and Dane Kilo and Tom Carroll, these are, these are, we shared, we shared that dream. Like, you know, we're the pioneers. Yeah. When I won the Pipe Masters, I won $5,000. Like, that's how long ago it was. Wow. I wrote a single thing. You know, like, we were, we were doing things that had never been done. We were living a dream. We were going for it. And, um, you know, if you didn't make some money, you were back home and you were off tour. Like it, it was, it was, it was just such a, and you, you know, you got to be in the surf magazines and you're heroes when you showed up at contests and everyone wanted your autograph. There'd be, honestly, Alessandro, it's so hard to relate to nowadays, but there'd be 10 to 20,000 people on the beach at every contest. There was no internet. There was no Instagram. I mean, people showed up by the thousands to watch us compete. We were like the circus. And, and it, was, it, it was nothing like now. Uh, and, I, you know, now is good for now. But that was good for then, and I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So to have those memories, and, and what's also funny is now I look back at with people I didn't like. I never liked Shane Horan. He didn't like me. I didn't like Gary Elkerton. He didn't like me. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, it's funny. Brad Gerlach, Martin Potter, all these guys, like, we didn't like each other, you know? Some guys you like, some guys you didn't like. And 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 even Aki. And now, like, I see these guys, I just want to give them a hug and a kiss, you know? Like, <laughs> we, we, we did it. We lived it. Of course. Of we course. did it. You know, we, we we lived that dream. You know, when I see these guys, I just, I just get a smile and just think, man, what a great time to have lived. What a great memory. Definitely, definitely. And then you started a career as a coach? right you you coach yeah. the u.s team um if i have to ask you the same question of at the beginning what is the most important thing in surfing what is the most important thing in coaching in your opinion wow gosh well uh to be prepared when you compete i think that's the most important thing is to be prepared when you compete the, yeah. uh, the great strength of my career is I was a very good surfer, but I don't consider myself a great surfer. I was a great tube rider, but I was a very good surfer. And there are many surfers better than me, uh, even when I was in the top 10 in the world, but I was a great competitor. And, and I, was, I was prepared to compete. Like, you, you have to be prepared to compete. And, you know, so when I coached the, when I coached the Chilean surf team, uh, for years, and then the U.S. surf team two different times, and ultimately to a world championship. You know, I had I, I would we would do the training. We 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 prepare ourselves in training. You, you have to figure out you know your boards. You have to you know you have to improve the technical elements of your surfing. You need to improve your co com competition skills and how you manage twenty minutes in the water. And, and instincts, the decisions you make to, to use priority or to not use priority, but you have to be prepared. And the way you be prepared is to train and give your best effort in your training. I never really coached at a contest, but I did all my coaching in practice and in training. So you would be ready to be prepared for that moment. That's, I was prepared to compete against Rabbit. I was compared, prepared to compete against Dane Kialoa and Sean Thompson. And so I really believe that in all your training and all your free surfing, you're preparing yourself, what we say, muscle memory, instincts to compete at the highest level. You have to be prepared. You do not want to put a, a singlet on, a jersey on, on any level of competition and not be ready to give your best. So you have to be prepared in all your training. When you show up to compete, when you paddle out, you got to have a plan. You need to be prepared. Kelly Slater is always prepared. Yeah. He knows what the tide is doing, which ways are the best ways, how the judges are judging, what they're looking for. And 20 years ago, CJ Hobgood said something to me about Kelly Slater. He said this. He said, Kelly Slater 
gets the best waves at the best spot all the time. And he's prepared. So uh, as a coach, I always wanted the athletes to be prepared to give their best and to live with it. So if you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. But don't lose because you weren't prepared. So to me, the most important thing is to be prepared to compete and then give your best effort and live with it. Win or lose. Yeah. It looks like so simple to say, but I guess it's very difficult to put in place, right? It's uh... Right. And, and, you know, certain things like golf, a lot can go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You know, uh, you know, the best golfers have the worst rounds, right? Like a lot can go wrong. You know, there's so much you can't control in surfing. So whatever you can control, make sure you, you put it together and you're ready. Yeah. And then you just have to trust your instincts. But there's so much like, you know, especially like when you compete in Europe, the tide changes so much. You can have the best plan that you're going to surf this left. And then the tide changes in your heat, and all of a sudden, Mark Acalupo is catching rights, and there's no more left. You know, like, but you still, you still have to be prepared, and then you have to make the adjustments. Uh, surfing is so beautiful. That's why, like, you know, wave pools are cool, but one of the things that makes surfing so special, especially if you watch the Olympics, is that it's, anything can happen. It's so random. Yes. Like, it's just so random. That's part of the excitement of it. You know, who can respond? Who can, you know, if anyone watched the semifinals of the Olympics when Kano Igarashi was against Gabriel Mendina, yeah. and he did that huge air reverse with a minute to go, it just, that was all the beauty of surfing. Kanoa's game plan, Gabriel Mendina's game plan, and then Kanoa executes the most amazing maneuver to beat the world champion to get to the gold medal round. It That's what makes surfing so special. But you got to be prepared. And then you just have to trust your instincts. And that's the beauty of surfing. Like, how come Tom Curran always got the best wave when it mattered most? <laughs> you know? And, and, and it, it just, there's, like, there's things about surfing and competing that you just can't control. And somehow the great ones like Gabriel Medina, they just somehow, they just get that wave and then they get it done. It's pretty special. It's very unique. That's what makes surfing so special. Yeah, it's a combination of uh, preparation and sometimes, like uh, you, you said, uh, you know, in the case of Japan, a little well, bit of luck, right? Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, what? what? And, and you can't coach it. Like, somehow, somehow, Tom Curran always got the ways he needed when he needed it. And Kelly Slater was the same way. But some guys are really good surfers, and it just seems like, You know, they might win contests, but when it really has to happen, it just doesn't happen. And you can't explain it. And and I and also, you know, you just know great surfers when you see them. I saw when I saw Martin Potter at 15, I was like, oh no. You know, like you just knew Martin Potter was great. When I saw Mark Acalupo's first wave at 16, when I saw him at Nairbean, the first wave I saw him caught, I just thought, oh no. You know, like You just knew. Yeah. And it's just funny like that. And this and this young girl that's made the world tour now, Katie Simmers, is 16. And everyone's talking about her. She won the U.S. Open. When I saw her at 12 years of age and, and she was on, she was going to be on the U.S. team, I just thought, you can't coach that. She's like Tom Kern. It's, it's, it's great. It's just a talent, not just a great athlete, but a great surfer. And they always get the right waves. And they're so special. When they come along, you just have to appreciate it. So I saw those guys in my career, and I've seen them as a coach. And it just makes surfing special. When you see these beautiful, great athletes, they do on things like waves. They, it's like ballet, and it's just so beautiful, and it's so special. It's art. It's athleticism. It's sport. It's competition. And, you know, free surfing is one thing. Like we said, you want to enjoy it. You want to have a good time. But when you're competing at the highest level in the world and you're someone like Gabriel Mendina or Italo, it's just, or Felipe, it's just so special to watch. Yeah. Man, I just love it. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. I love it as well. So um, now a, a, a different question, you know, like I actually was really looking forward to this point because um, you said it yourself before, 35 years with Jesus, right? How, how, yeah. did, uh, yeah. how did your uh, calling or vocation started? Like, uh, 
how 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 it happened that you became um, a minister? Of, of yeah, church? well, so I was raised going to church. My mom was Catholic, and so we always went to church every weekend. And uh, you know, I had a good sense of you know right and wrong. And I, I tell people I always believe in God, and I always believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But I, you know, I was naughty. You know, I got in a lot of trouble, you know, and I always, I always felt bad for it, you know. But uh, I thought, well, you know, I, I would ask for forgiveness, and I, you know, I, I say I'm not as bad as my neighbor, but I'm, I'm worse than the other neighbor. You know? okay. So I just, I always believed in God, and I always felt like God had His hand on my life, and I always used to ask myself, like, how come I get to be the California kid and be on the pro tour? So I always had a sense of gratitude um, toward God for the good things in my life. But I never thought like, oh, I'm going to, you know, be a pastor and serve Jesus or something. I just don't want to be a bad guy or something. But uh, when I won the Pipeline Masters, uh, many, many people know this story. But when I won the Pipeline Masters uh, that day, after the awards, it, it rained and it rained very hard. Uh, it, 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 was, it rained so hard that everyone left the beach. And what, what most people can't even try and understand is that I just won the pipeline masters and about 20 minutes later, it was raining so hard that there wasn't anyone left on the beach. No one. And, and I was there with my boards and I was the only one on the beach <laughs> and, and, and it was raining like a monsoon. It was raining so hard. And I just, you know, this profound thought was in my mind, like, wow, I mean, I, I, I'm the champion of my masters and I'm all alone. And I just had this great emotion of winning the pipe masters and I'm all alone right now. And, and it was just feeling like I was alone in the universe. I was alone on the beach of pipeline. I just lived my dream. I was alone in the universe and it was the most empty feeling uh, imaginable. And I, and I really believe that God allowed me to experience to be on top of the mountain, to be the champion of the pipeline masters, and then to be all alone in the rain, cold, in the dark at the end of the day on the same day, to be that high and to be that low. And I always tell people, I feel like that's where I think God really began to uh, get a hold of my life. And it would be three years later that I would commit my life to Jesus Christ. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, but, you know, I I'm going to live for Jesus and uh, I want to do what's right. And I want to obey God's word. And I, I want to, I don't want to, you know, be, be selfish. I want to serve other people. And I, I ended up just making myself available. I began to go to churches and I'd show like a surf movie and tell people about Jesus. And one thing led to another, one door opened and then another opened. And eventually by 1988, I was asked to be a pastor. And uh, then God brought me my beautiful wife that we've been married for 34 years. And then, you know, we, we moved to the East Coast for years. I didn't even surf. And we just had all these experiences of growing in our faith, growing in our marriage, growing as parents, and growing serving the Lord. And it's been a wonderful journey. It's been 34 years. I'm 60 years old. I have four kids. I have six grandkids. I've been pastoring churches for 34 years. And you know, I've, I've, I've learned that it's not about me. It's about Jesus and, and serving others. And uh, I, I would, you know, I have lots of regrets, but it's, it's not in serving the Lord. It's more about my pride and my selfishness and, you know, how I would, you know, be, do things better. But that's part of life. You want to grow as a person. And I, I just feel like I'm still growing. But after I went into ministry, Matt Warshaw, the famous writer for surfing, he was a very good pro surfer, and he was a great writer, and we knew each other very well. He wrote for Surfer Magazine. He wrote a book called The Encyclopedia of Surfing, yeah. and, and he summarized my life, and, and this is what he said. And he, he wasn't a believer or anything like that. He just said, Joey Buran, the kid from Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, won the Pipeline Masters, found Jesus, went into ministry, and who could ever blame him? And he basically was saying, if you were Joy Brand and you won the Pipeline Masters, wouldn't you serve God too? <laughs> 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 and, and I tell people, like, yeah, you know, like, I lived, a, I lived a dream, I lived a miracle, and God called me into ministry. I didn't, I didn't like, I'm going to be a pastor. Like, I just went through open doors, and eventually I was called to be a pastor, you know, and, and uh, you know, 
it's funny because I often ask myself, like, why did God call me to be a surfer? Why did God call me to be a pro surfer? The California kid, the pipe masters, the Hall of Fame, and then to be in ministry. But I tell people, you know, I minister to people like when they're dying. I minister to people when their child just died. I do weddings. I do funerals. I mean, honestly, Alessandro, I show up when people have taken their lives, you know, like a first responder. I've dealt with great trauma in my life. And I look back and I learned so much as a pro surfer. I was taught so much. I, I remember doing a wedding with a thousand people there and everyone was so nervous. It was a, a like a, a Navy commander. Oh, wow. And I turned to the groom and I said, you know, are you nervous? And he goes, I'm so nervous. And he was a surfer. And he goes, I'm so nervous. I can't even. And I go, dude, I feel like I'm about to have a heat in the pipe masters right now. And I made him laugh. And then we went out there, we did a wedding ceremony with a thousand people and he committed his life to his wife. You know, like I, I, everything that my life has been as a surfer, it's carried over in the ministry. And, and so it's all part of the plan. It's and interconnected, I just thank God for it all. right? It's all interconnected. It is. Yeah. It is. You know, when I won Brazil, when I won in Brazil in 1980, Shane Haran was beating me in that semifinal. And I was at Apodor Beach, and I looked up, and you could see the Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio. No. And I looked at that statue, and I just thought, I felt like God just said, you're going to win this contest. And then I detained her, and then I won the contest. But I look back over my life, and I see that God had his hand on everything. So, of course, I'm going to serve him. No and if he's called me to be a pastor, I'm going to try and be the best I can be. You know, I've never pastored big churches. I've never pastored a church of more than a couple hundred people. But I've always just given my best to the Lord. And um, I, I've never felt like I did anything profound in ministry. But really, the whole life of Jesus, there's nothing profound in serving people and dying on the cross for other people's sins. Hmm. You know? There's greatness and forgiveness and humility and serving others and making life about others and being a blessing and being kind and gentle and loving and gracious. There's there's greatness in that. And and you don't have to be the pipe master's champion to lose your life and serve other people. And that's to lose your life and serve other people for Jesus. That's far greater than winning the pipe masters, you know, and in eternity. What's a pipe master compared to serving others in Jesus name? That's my life. That's my worldview. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I really like the, your point of view. And, uh, the fact well, thank that, you for asking, Alessandro. I appreciate it. If people ask, I'll tell them. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. You know, um, and so now, uh, are you working on some special project, something like uh, uh, that you are like willing to, to do in the next uh, month, year to come? Or you just... Uh, living your life with your family and uh, with your ministry and uh, uh, that's it. Are you well, that's something a, cool? that, that, <laughs> Well, that's a great question. I appreciate that. Well, I'm 60 now, right? You know, so when you're older, you know, all, all my friends that are 60 years old, like Tom Carroll, you know, when you're 60, if it's a, if it's a heat, you know, it, you're, you're, in the, you're in the latter part of the heat, you know, the final five minutes, you know, that you got to, You got to close it out. You know, you got to, you, you want to finish strong and life's different when you're 20, the fight masters in front of you. When you're 60, eternity is in front of you. And, and so I've lived a, I had a great career in surfing. You know, I was the Olympic coach for USA just three years ago and uh, God, you know, called me to let go of that. And that was kind of hard to do, but I did. And so I feel like I retired from coaching, although I'll, I'll still give advice. You know, like I'm walking down the beach and I see a guy catch a great wave and he comes in. I go, dude, that was a great first turn, man. Great turn. You're on rail. Everything was clean. They're like, oh, thanks. You know, <laughs> uh, I just, I, I like to watch the WSL, you know, when the, when the contests are going on. I, I, you know, people always ask me, why do you cheer for Gabriel Mendina? And I go, well, because I was like Gabriel Mendina. I was gnarly. You know, like I, I, I cheer for Gabriel Mendina and uh, I, I love to watch pro surfing and I really enjoy the sport. Uh, I still go surfing sometimes. I, I, you know, I'm just trying to be faithful in ministry. You know, I feel, I feel like for the next five to 10 years, there's a lot of good opportunity just to keep being faithful as a pastor. I really want to enjoy my marriage. I'm going to be married for 34 years in March. I want to just be a better husband in 2022 than I was any year before that. My kids are all adults. 
I've got all the grandkids. I want to pour my, I want to pour my life into my grandkids and just love on them and share my faith and share the dream and inspire them to do uh, everything God has for them to dream big dreams, to be great. Uh, you know, through Instagram and social media, I always keep things positive. I don't ever want to put negative stuff out there. There's enough negative stuff. My my opinions don't matter. I just want to build people up and encourage them. I love to dance. I love to dance. I love to do hip hop and break dancing and shuffle dancing. I love to dance because it's 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 challenging. I can learn new moves. Uh, I, I want to show you can do new things when you're 60. I tell people my best surfing is behind me, but my best dancing is in front of me because I can <laughs> learn new stuff. I got to stretch more, but, uh, you know, I can learn new stuff. So I'm not really doing anything profound other than enjoying my journey. That's good. You know, I'm enjoying life and, uh, you know, I have no malice or bitterness toward anyone. Uh, and I try to respect everybody and, you know, I just try and bring the love and the positive vibe and, and point people to Jesus, and at some point, my journey is going to be done, and I just want it to be a, a legacy of love and encouragement when I'm, you know, behind and when I stand before the Lord. So I'm not, you know, like, I think, oh, someday I'll write a book, you know, but then I think, no, nah, you know, the, the story's not done, so my kids will write a book, you know, and, yeah. and, and, you know, someday I think, well, I'm going to do this, and you know what, I just, I love Jesus, I love my wife, I love my life, I love my family, I love humanity. And, uh, you know, if God calls me to go share my faith in Russia, I'll go back to Russia. If he calls me to write the book, I'll write the book. If he calls me to dance really good and, and glorify him through dancing, that's what I'm going to do. I just, I, I'm, I'm, we've all learned through the last two years of what we've been through with COVID-19 and the stuff that, you know, you keep it simple and, 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 and you just stay in the moment and love people. And that's always going to work. That's yeah. always going to work for life. Stay in the moment, have a vision for the future, have some goals, but keep it simple and love people and forgive people. And that's always going to do well with your life. Definitely, definitely. So we're going to finish our interview with a short Q&A session. So please answer the first thing that comes up to your mind, okay? Sure. The best sure. surfboard that you ever ridden. Well, the 710 single fin I won the Pipe Masters on. I used that board for six years on the North Shore. I got a cover shot at YMA on that board. I surfed Sunset on that board, and I won the Pipe Masters on that board. That's the best board I ever had. Huh. Uh, your favorite shaper of all time? Mike Barron from Oceanside. Mike Barron is one of my best friends, and he, he does burn surfboards now. Yeah. He made my boards for the peak of my career. I had a lot of great shapers, Gary Linden, Donald Takayama, Glenn Manami, Midget Smith. But my favorite shaper of all time, Mike Barron from Oceanside, California. Fantastic. Personal question, your favorite song? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. But uh, um, Summer Theme, Percy Faith. 1961, Summer Theme, Percy Faith, okay. one of the all-time classic instrumentals. My parents used to play it all the time when I was a kid. It brings back happy memories. Okay. Still does. I used it for an Instagram post just a month ago with my grandkids. Percy Faith and uh, Summer Theme, Theme for Summer. Your favorite surf spot? Pipeline. Well, of course. <laughs> Your favorite <laughs> surfer of all time? Tom Carroll. Yeah, I was expecting that answer. <laughs> after, <laughs> after, after like the interview, I understood that there is a special relationship with uh, with Tom Carroll. And then the last question yep. is a little bit unusual, but as you said that you are married for 34 years and now you are even a grandfather, uh, I would like to ask you your best relationship advice. Well, obviously, being married three, four years, you you know you you, you learn how to, to live with someone, and um, I think my my best relationship advice is to to love unconditionally, and and to to forgive, to to be able to love others, and and think how others think, and to forgive others. You know, so many people quit living because they can't forgive, and and bitterness will destroy you, and. Uh, by the grace of God, me being forgiven, I've learned to forgive others. And I've really learned in life, because people hurt you, and you hurt people. I've hurt a lot of people, and I've, I've asked for forgiveness. And in some cases, they're gone, and I can't ask for forgiveness. But people hurt you, 
People hurt you all the time. People steal, they lie, they cheat, they do, they do evil things. And, but I have found through, by me being forgiven of my sins, that I can forgive other people. And if I can forgive other people, I'm going to be free. I'm going to be free to live life. And I just want to be able to see anyone, anytime, anywhere, and just be able to give them a hug and tell them I love them. I don't want to have bitterness. So I think if you can learn to love others and forgive others, that's the best relationship advice I have. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. Thanks a lot, Joy, for being with me on the show today. I look forward to talk to you very soon. All right, Alessandro, have a great Christmas and keep the stoke. God bless you. you and thank you for asking me about my life. <laughs> You're welcome. Talk to you soon. Ciao. Take care, man. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed our today's episode. If you want to know more about us, please follow www.thetempleofsurf.com and all our social media. Mahalo! 